time. Uh, so today I will tell you why 3D printing software workflow sucks. Uh, this is kind of obvious. You can read it from the name of the, my talk. Well, uh, the thing is we introduced, uh, or basically I introduced uh, 3D printing as a feature for Fedora 19. That was mostly because it was only paid to do it. Uh, if I want to have it tracked on Wiki and stuff like that, there was no real feature. People have been asking me like, what, what Fedora brings as a feature for 3D printing when you can do this for any other distro or from Mac OS or from Windows? And I said, well, it's not a feature, it's basically just a set of packages, but it's called a feature only because our infrastructure. And I was thinking how to make a 3D printing a real feature. So I will tell you how the software workflow is done now, and I will tell you why this is bad and what should be done to make 3D printing a real feature thing that we can offer users as, hey, use Fedora as the best you can get for 3D printing, and if you use Ubuntu, it will just suck. So what happens now is that I get emails like this quite often, like, hey, Miro, print me this, I will give you shit loads of money or nothing or whatever. Well, you, would, you would think that I will just go and print stuff like that, it's just one click and then get the money and profit. Uh, but it's not so easy. If you got a file, there are several steps you have to go through. This is very basic uh, diagram. It's more complicated, much more than that. But I wouldn't, just, I try to not frighten you so much. So you get this file, which is STL. That's the file format you need. So that's good. If you get something else, you have to convert it and do crazy stuff like that. But you don't know who created it and how. And with STLs, uh, it's a mesh representation and the mesh is usually broken. If you get it from someone and it's not you and you don't know how it was created, 99% is broken, something is bad. So you open it in some application and it will show you that something is bad. Uh, the topology, or the topology of the mesh is that you have triangles and that you have to have normals and it, it's kind of complicated and a lot of applications for creating 3D stuff just don't give a shit, sorry. So it's uh, broken from, you know, you do it in AutoCAD or something, but this is usually what people give us to print. You know, usually they are architects and they do ARCHICAD or AutoCAD or whatever and it's the worst output I have ever seen. And if you just put it to the 3D printing software, just, hey, here you go, print me this, you will get probably something else, which is not something you get shitloads of money for if you just give them something else. So you have to repair it. And there are several ways how to repair mesh. There is uh, add mesh, which is a command line tool. It's from 1996 and it hasn't been developed since then but it somehow works uh, in most cases. What, if you look at the picture, there are some the problems in the mesh and there is also another problem. That if you print it like that, you will have a lot of support under that thing that's just laying in the air. So you have to rotate it so it's flat. So let's just you know use add mesh, rotate it, move it to the origin so it's not floating somewhere in the 3D space and uh, do some checks and stuff like that and then write it. Uh, this will work, but uh, some of the errors in the mesh will be not repaired because other mesh does not do all the repairing, just do some. So you have to probably use another tool. Then there is uh, MeshLab, which is not command line interface, which is better for my grandma because she don't like this. And you would say it's easy because it has a graphical user interface and so you can just easily click these things and repair your mesh. But then you realize you got these filters and you got hundreds of them and you don't know what any of them does. So you try and you screw your mesh even more and you don't fix it. Uh, so MeshLab is not a good 
uh, application for fixing. If you know your workflow in MeshLab, you can fix it quite easily, but if you just give it to someone and say, hey, here you go, this is your bad mesh, this is your MeshLab, and just go repair it, it's not gonna work. Then there is NetFab. NetFab works, it has automatic repairing button, magic, dude, finished. What's, what, what's bad about NetFab is that NetFab is a proprietary software, it's closed source. You can get it for free, as in free beer. It runs on Linux, it runs on Fedora and any other kind of Linux. But we cannot have it in our repositories and we cannot use it in official Fedora feature stuff. It even offers a cloud service. When you just upload your STL file and it will email you link for downloading the repair stuff. I even wrote a Python script that just uploads it and grabs it from the email so you don't have to do that. Uh, and they are fine. You just have to give them your email address and they can spam you with some kind of buy our stuff. They do it once a month. So this is mesh repairing. This, this is just the beginning of the process. And we have three uh, possibilities how to do it, or maybe there are more, but this is what I know. Uh, not all of them, or n none of them is perfect. Uh, Admesh would be great for integration in other tools, but it's not 100% repairing the mesh. Uh, MeshLab is just, just don't use MeshLab. And NetFab is fine, but it's uh, closed source and it has no common line interface or library you can use in to integrate it to other tools. So now we are in the first step of getting the money from that thing. Then you have to slice it. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, this is what the user wanna see when he repairs mesh. He doesn't wanna see anything at all. He just wanna at least hit the button repair or just have it done automatically before other steps are going to happen. So you have Repair your mesh, it's nice green, that means like okay, it's standing, so the print will probably go, and you have to feed it to your printer. What is that printer doesn't just get mesh and print it because it's low cost electronics, it's so weak, it couldn't calculate how to print it. So you have to slice it, which means layer by layer calculate where the uh, hot end will go and print the stuff. This is one layer of G-code. Uh, yeah, you can inspect it in tools and I will show you la later. But there are several softwares to convert mesh to G-code, which is the instructions for the printer. And one of them is this. As you can see, it's very user-friendly, very good looking on your GNOME desktop or whatever and not only that's ugly, it's also old, not developed anymore, and it mix, just mix options. You know, if you wanna get something that changes the output, and there is an option that changes the printer configuration right there, and you just screw, there is, I can't use it. We have a, a, my colleague Marek, he tr tried really hard, he spent like half a year configuring this mastodon, and now we have our profiles and nobody wants to touch it. There are just like two options we know safely we can change, is how many prints do we want at once, and if you change anything else, you just got very bad results. It's also very slow. Slicing is very complicated calculation, and this just you do is in serial process, it uses only one CPU, and it's very, very slow. Then there is Slicer, which is more modern, uh, has much nicer interface, where options related to your printer are separated from options related to what you want, like if you want the print to be hollow or full and stuff like that. And it's very rapidly developed, like new features every month, and new bugs every month. It's like, you know, release, early release often. And this is somehow better, 
but still not perfect. Then you got Cura, which is a tool from Ultimaker guys, but it's open source and free software, uh, mostly. And the stuff that's not is just stripped out of it, and it works. Uh, you can set something, and you can see it in 3D. And basically, you just upload your STL file in there, or drag and drop, and it will slice it. It doesn't ask you any questions, but you can set a lot of stuff on the left side. Uh, the thing is, it's very Ultimaker branded. Uh, for those who don't know, Ultimaker is a seller of free uh, printers. And even it tries to do stuff like uploads firmware to your, to your Ultimaker. And if you don't have Ultimaker, it can break your other printer and stuff like that. And it crashes a lot. Like, I haven't seen that application that crashes so much often. And he, usually they just say, yeah, it doesn't crash for us, so just go figure it yourself. Blender is Kiss Slicer, which is probably even uglier than Scaling Forge, which was the first one. And that also have lots of options, good results, but it's uh, only free as in free beer. So here is Basically, some tools uh, are for slicing. There, are, there is more of them in the notes. I will share my slides later. There are some links. Uh, Scaneforge was the first one. I can't just describe it without being dirty. Uh, it's all upstream is dead. It's extremely slow, and something is done in very bad way in your models. Uh, slicer, it's good. But sometimes the results are just crazy. This is like, you know, it makes little dots of plastic and you don't know why and stuff like that. Then there is Cura, which is Ultimaker focused and branded, crashes a lot. And then there is Kisslicer, which is ugly and not open source and free software. But in total, what I don't like about these tools is that it has too many options. Even these. You know, this is not so many options, but still too much. If I give it to someone who doesn't know, I don't want him to change my size of my printer and stuff like that. So what you should really see when you slice is something like this, and that should be it. You know, high speed, high quality, you want it quick or you want it nice. Probably you just want both, but that's not yet possible. And if it's hollow or full, uh, how many copies, what the size should be, and what is your material. Everything else should be just, you know, some magically guessed from the printer itself. So you have your G code. That's great, but you want to somehow put it into printer and get a plastic part you want to print. So you just don't get a, I don't know, put a G code on a flash drive and put it in your printer. Some of them works like that, but they are expensive. If you have something, something low cost, it doesn't work. So you have to get G code, put it into your printer. For that, you need a software because you cannot just the electronics in the printer cannot handle all the G code at once. It has some small buffer and you have to be connected to the printer and just put it to the buffer when it's empty or when there is space for more. This is printer face. See, I would say it's the most used software for controlling 3D printers, at least the open source 3D printers. Uh, it's not that bad. You can manually uh, move your printer when it's not printing. Uh, it shows you G code. It has some logs and you can just connect and print. What is like, what I don't like is that you have to, there is the port field and baud rate field and if you don't get it right, it will just doesn't work and stuff like that. It tries to guess when you run it and your printer is connected, it will guess it right. Uh, but if you run it before you connect your printer and then you connect your printer and just click connect, it doesn't work and you have to restart the app or stuff like that. So not very user friendly, like it's not plug in and work, plug and play on a host it called. Then you have Repetir host, which some people like more. But what I don't like about it is written in C-sharp, and it uses mono, 
which wouldn't be so bad, but it also uses bin forms, or how is that called? So it looks like Windows 95, and that's not nice. Both of these tools can integrate some slicers, so you just don't need to run two applications, but you just run one from the other, but it's not so good. What, what is good about Cura is that it can slice, and it can also send the G code. So this is much better than any other approach, so you have just one app, and it works. What I like is Octoprint. It's a small uh, device focus. You have some kind of Raspberry Pi or QB board or stuff like that. It runs Linux and QB board, uh, sorry, Octoprint as a web service. And you just have this small device mounted on your printer and connected to your network. So you just go and connect to, I don't know, printer.local and you can print from web interface. Which is good, because you don't have to be uh, still connected to your printer. You can just upload it, then go out, and then come back and connect and see what, what is happening. And it works pretty good. But, um, so if I just summarize the printing software, uh, it means you have some options. Most of them work somehow, but Either it requires you to be connected during the whole print, or you need a server that's run, running on your machine or somewhere. And it's not very good thing. Uh, and you know, you can print with this app, and you can just hit the close button. And it will just close, and your print is over. So there are some, maybe it just ask you really or not, but it's, you know, you cannot just suspend your machine or something like that. So finally, you print the stuff and you get your money. Or, or not. Uh, this is another problem and I don't want to talk about it. Uh, but you see the, the printer I brought here, uh, it broke yesterday. And it's always, when you want to show it to someone, it's broken. and it's some kind of always broken. So let's not go there. So so what? What do we do about this? How do we fix it? How do we do this workflow better? What I really want to do is just open the model and hit Control-P and like print and let's just print. That's all I want to do. And maybe, so it asked me some questions I s showed you before. So this is what happens when I want to print something in normal printing. You know, you can select papers, pages per side, paper size, stuff like that, uh, if you wanted the color or not, quality. I think you saw this quite often. You can select your printer, and you can have network printers and select network printer. Uh, this works because of tabs, or I don't know how to read it properly. This is the thing that runs on your system, uh, eat resources when you don't need it, and, uh, but it works. You know, just connect your printer or you are in a network that offers you some printers and you can use them. For example, in Brno Red Hat Office, when I'm connected, I can see all the printers all around the building and I can just select, yeah, print me this on first floor and I will just go and grab it. What we need is have something like this for 3D printers. I don't really, it doesn't have to be named like this, but it should provide the same thing. Uh, I even heard of uh, tries to use this system for 3D printers, which is kind of weird, but it would work because it is so, uh, it doesn't, you ha don't have to send postscripts, you can send G codes if you want. So it should work. But what has to be done to create such a service, such a daemon, such a feature? You have to have some 3D printers management, like you have in your normal printers management, so you can add new printers and do stuff. There is a project by uh, Lulzbot, who is a 3D printing manufacturer from the US, but they are very open source friendly. All the machines are open source, and they promote open source software for 3D printing. They just don't create their own crazy stuff like MakerBot. And if, if you have MakerBot, you have to download MakerWare, which is like two hundreds of megs 
of some binary stuff you don't know what it does and if you try to use MakerBot with this software I showed you it will fail and not because of technology because it uses G code and the technology is the very same but MakerBot will just ask you some handshake and who are you are you my software no so goodbye so we have some 3D printers management. Uh, so you can add printer, you can see them, and that's what they are creating in LooseBot. Uh, currently it means that you connect printer and it knows about it. And it can offer you stuff, like use it immediately. So you don't have to choose port or something like that, you just have it. We need uh, to enhance automatic repairing. Uh, it could be done, add mesh, as written in 1996, it looks like it, but it's, I think we can add more features and have a library that will just repair our mesh. And we need something that will just decide that let's not print this this way because that would be crazy and print it this way. Which is, for people, this is very easy problem. Because you just look at it and you decide. But for software and for computers, this is a very complicated thing. Uh, one guy from our lab in, at our university in Prague, uh, he's trying to sort this in his uh, master's thesis. Let's see how that happened or how it will work. We need hardware configuration saved in the firmware of the printer. So I don't have to keep information about all my printers in slicing software or my machine so that the printer knows how is it big, uh, how big the nozzle is, what temperatures it can reach safely, stuff like that, and just have it stored, and if you connect it to 3D printer management, it will say, oh, okay, I can see you are this printer, okay, let's use this options and not bother user about it. And if it's not there, obviously, user can specify it somehow. And this should be possible. You now you configure it once, then you build it, and you embed it to the, to the printer, and then you don't have to care. For example, uh, there is this printer in the lobby, the tall one, and uh, I want in my laptop here, so I asked Wojta to print from his, and we actually have to find uh, configuration files for that printer from GitHub, where a local hackerspace store their configuration, and we have to figure out which one to use, and stuff like that. I, instead, if it is embedded in the printer, just plug it in, and it will work. Just I believe a better approach. We need desktop integration. Uh, what I mean by desktop integration uh, is that you get a nice tray icon saying printing is in 50%, estimated time is that, and then you get nice notification and stuff like that. Not like it, you don't have to use 3D printing to control your desktop, it would be not a good idea. But have it like these things most of them are just ugly, you know. We don't want that as a feature in GNOME 3 or stuff like that. We want a gnome application in our gnome Fedora. We need some API uh, for this so we can write more apps for that. Uh, so when you have an application that is capable of opening and uh, mesh and show you to the user, then uh, we have to offer a way so that it can print it directly and send the mesh to this crazy system and print it. That's it. Uh, I see we have like 10 more minutes for questions, so please leave some feedback on this URL and hit me with anything you want to know. Nothing? Okay. Just wait, wait for the microphone. So as, as far as I can see it, I'm, I'm not doing much with 3D printing, but I see it in my hackerspace. The main problem is getting control over all those fucking options you have in the slicer. They're like, I don't know, if you, if you, if you manage to get control over this, you also can fly a Boeing 747 because it surely has less knobs. And run a nuclear plant or whatever you want to do. And the problem is to, to get control over this. And one thing I think 
what most people, well, at least our guys don't don't really get to do is like having control over what knobs actually changed. So I think you need something like an integration with this Git or anything else that actually shows you, well, last print didn't went so well, what knobs did we actually change? And yes, you want to get to the point where you have a, a pre-configured option of saying, well, you have this thing and it, yes, it maybe has 50% uh, filling and it, it works on the printer, but you have to get there. And there, you're right, you can look at, put a half year of work in there and still not get a working configuration. And I think that that's one of the main problems because people cannot relate all the knobs they twiddled with the results they get. And I guess um, some tools that gives you a better control over, I changed this and this is the results I got and a better way of, 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 of having a, some kind of log file. You, you can at least write in some notes like, well, this didn't went so well with overhangs or didn't work so well with the top or whatever, and so you can get improvement. And what I see is people don't get improvement because they have no clue what it actually changed. There was no question, probably, but I, let me just follow. Uh, what we do now is we store our configuration in Git, and it's uh, mostly text files, so you can clearly see what, is it, what have you changed. But it's not very user-friendly, right? But uh, what I mean is that you don't ever need to touch this uh, when this works. You know, There is uh, someone who built the printer, and he knows about its configuration, and can do stuff like, yeah, let's do it better, update the config and upload it back to the printer and he can store his config in Git. That's not important. Important is that, that I can just get some computer, put it to the printer, connect it and hit print. And that's, we are not there yet. And I believe we can go there, but it will be a long, long run. Okay, so if you come up with more questions later, you can see me in the lobby or around and ask me, and if not, just thank you for listening.